the first teaching of yoga is that this body is only a vehicle. It's not really myself. I'm not black or white. I'm not pretty or ugly. I'm not man or woman. I'm not young or old. I'm not American or Indian. I'm not rich or poor. These are bodily designations. These are the things that keep us apart from each other, aren't they? These are the things that wars are fought over. See, these are the things that prejudice develops over. These are the things that all anxieties, in fact, develop over, are these bodily false egos, these bodily designations. Oh, I'm black, I'm white, I'm Christian, I'm Jew, I'm young, I'm old, I'm pretty, I'm ugly, I'm this, I'm that. But I am not these things. Just like I say, this is my hand, this is my arm, this is my belly, this is my head, these are my thoughts. But where is that I that's saying my hand, my leg, my belly, my thoughts? That I was there when I had a ten-year-old body. When I was having ten-year-old thoughts, I was thinking I was Davy Crockett. You see? But that's changed. The body's changed, and my ego, my sense of identity, has also changed. But I, the one that's watching these different changes of body, these different changes of mind, that I, myself, my consciousness, that's been there and will go on as I change 80 years old, 90 years old, and again and again and again. That consciousness is the real beautiful thing in everyone here, isn't it? Just look around you. It's life, isn't it? The grass you're sitting on, the trees that make the atmosphere so cool in here, the people that you're sitting next to, your loved ones, your children, your wife, your husband, your mother, your father. It's life that makes it beautiful, isn't it? Because suppose we took the life out of this tree, suppose we took the life out of this body, took the life out of the body of your child or your wife or your husband, would you want that body anymore? Would anyone be here be happy to take their beautiful wife or beautiful husband home if there was no life in that body? No, you'd want to leave the body right here about six feet underground, isn't it? Because the body is not the thing that we're attracted to. It's not the thing that we love in one another. The thing that we're loving, the thing that's attracting us to this atmosphere, to one another, is that consciousness, that living force. And it's not black, believe me. It's not white. It's not young. It's not old. It's not man or woman, it's not pretty or ugly. It's far beyond these gross designations. It's called Satchitananda. It's eternal, it's full of knowledge, and it's full of bliss. But it's limited right now because of our attachments, because we meditate too much on the temporary. For example, we take care of this body, we brush its teeth, we comb its hair. When it gets wrecked, we take it to the body shop and get it patched up and glued up, etc. And we meditate on it. We look at it in the mirror and we think, oh, this is so nice, my hair, my chin, my eyes. See, and we meditate on our wife's body, too, our husband's body. Oh, she's so beautiful, or he's so wonderful, he speaks in such a deep voice, or she talks so sweetly. And we meditate on these bodily designations. Then there's children, right? Oh, isn't he cute? Goo, 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 goo. You see? The consciousness really doesn't need goo, 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 goo. You see? And then there's the dog, oh, here, Rover, lick my face. Uh, and again, we're meditating, my dog, my wife, my family, my country, it goes on extending. It's my country now, and uh, I have to extend my energy out to my fellow Americans, and my fellow this, and my fellow that. This is called limitation of consciousness. You see? This is how we limit our eternal, blissful, knowledgeable consciousness by these designations, by limiting it to these designations. So let's get free, right? Let's free our consciousness from these designations. Nobody wants to be limited, right? No one wants limited happiness. No one wants limited relationships. You don't really want to feel uptight around me, just like I don't want to feel uptight around you. But the only way we're going to actually be able to live together very peacefully and intimately is if we realize the beautiful thing in one another. That thing which makes us all equal, that thing which makes us equal with the plants, the trees, the animals, and everything else. And that's consciousness. That's the beautiful thing we're developing. And that's what this festival is all about. We're developing consciousness. And how? By sitting together, dancing together, singing together, feasting together, and serving together. We have to serve something. Don't you think so? Just think about it for a minute. We have to serve our belly at least, right? You have to put some food in it, right? You have to fill it up. Now, what else do you have to serve? Well, you have to serve so many things. You have to serve your boss. You have to serve your um, tax collector. You have to serve this. You have to serve that. Your wife, your children, your this, your that. 
But how long can we go on serving these things? How long can we go on serving the belly? For a few minutes, that's all. Then go on to serving something else. In this way, our mind is wandering, accepting something, and then rejecting it, accepting, rejecting, accepting, rejecting, looking for pleasure, isn't it? Why do I serve my belly? I'm looking for happiness. Why do I serve my wife? I'm looking for happiness. Why do I serve my children? For happiness. I'm serving because I want to be happy, and I know there's no other way to be happy but to serve. But what to serve which will bring the highest happiness, unlimited happiness, that we haven't found in this material world. Everything has a saturation point, like our belly, like our wife, like our family, like our eyes, ears, nose, our genital. It also has a saturation point. See, how long can we enjoy sex life? For some time, then we have to reject it and go on to something else. Because it has a saturation point like anything else. But there's a type of pleasure that has no saturation point, And that can be experienced just by a child. If he simply allows his consciousness to stop accepting, rejecting, accepting, rejecting, and fix on that unlimited pleasure within. Hare. Everyone can say that. Hare. Hare. That unlimited pleasure within. And if we fix our mind on this unlimited pleasure, then we'll become madmen. In the ordinary sense of the term, we'll become madmen. Because the people will think, why is he doing that? Over and over again. Hare Krishna, Hare Rama, Hare Krishna, Hare Rama, Hare Rama. Why doesn't he say Coca-Cola, 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 Coca-Cola? Why? Try chanting Coca-Cola for a while and you'll see why. For one thing, you're going to get really thirsty and you'll find out that the word Coca-Cola is not going to satisfy your thirst. You need the substance. But if you chant Hare Krishna, Hare Rama, Hare Krishna, Hare Rama, over and over again, you'll find out that that name and the object that unlimited reservoir of pleasure are the same. And therefore, whatever you could derive from the reservoir of unlimited pleasure, you can derive from the sound vibration. And therefore, you'll be very illuminated as you chant. You'll think, I can go on doing this forever, and you'll become a madman going through the streets. Hare Krishna, Hare Rama, Hare Krishna, Hare Rama. It's something you can do forever. While you're in jail, you can do it. You see, and you won't be in jail. You'll turn the jail into a place of self-realization. You see? When you're the president, you could do it, and you won't be the president, you'll be a self-realized yogi, really able to lead people to the path of perfection instead of cheating them. You won't be a wife anymore, a husband, or black, or white, or young, or old, or man, or woman. You'll be pure consciousness. You'll see yourself and everything as pure consciousness. And at that stage, you can really be happy. Then you can actually see things as they are and not be illusioned anymore. So this is the warm invitation of Krishna consciousness. It has nothing to do with black or white, young or old, or believe me, Christian or Jew or Hindu or anything like that. We consider these to be as much a part of false ego, Christian, Hindu, Jew, as we do black, white, young, old, man or woman. Because they're delegated to this body. I'm born in a Christian family, I call myself a Christian, right? I'm a born in a Hindu family, I call myself a Hindu. So because of this body, I'm a Hindu. Because of this body, I'm a Jew. And if I was born a million years ago, would I be a Hindu, Christian, or Jew? No. But I'd still be a servant. I'd still have my consciousness. See? Suppose you're born 100,000 years from now. Are you going to be a Christian, or a Hindu, or a Jew? No. But you'll still have your consciousness. You'll still have to serve. And you'll still want to be happy. So, the real religion which underlies Christianity, which underlies Hinduism, which underlies Judaism, which was taught by people who weren't Christians, like Jesus. He wasn't a Christian. And people that weren't Jews, like Moses, he wasn't a Jew either. You see? And people that weren't Muslims, like Hajjad Muhammad, he wasn't a Muslim. You see? Or people that aren't Buddhists, like Lord Buddha, who's not a Buddhist either. You see? Those persons who realize that religion, which underlies the organizations that came after them, which lost it for the most part, that realization, that can be had at any time, in any place, in any circumstance. Never mind what designation you may be in. And that realization is your loving service attitude. What does Krishna say? Abandon all religion and surrender unto me. And I promise I'll protect you from all karma, from all reactions, from millions of births. That's it. Surrender. Give your love to the Absolute and all living beings. Then you're in the real religion. 
And you won't call yourself a Christian, you won't call yourself a Hindu anymore, or a Jew, or this or that. Because you'll actually be able to communicate with every living being. So this is the warm invitation of Krishna consciousness. That you realize that beautiful nature of yourself, which was the nature of all great personalities, of all liberated souls. You and I are meant to be liberated souls. We're not meant to be in these false egos. We're not meant to be in these limited bodies and minds. You see? But we have to make the best use of it. It's a great tool, it's a great opportunity, especially this human life, for developing our consciousness. Krishna says, many, many births both you and I have passed. I can remember all of them, but you cannot. So it's many, many times we've taken birth. Therefore, it means we're learning a lesson. We're learning how to develop our consciousness to that point where we can actually fulfill our desires. Because no one wants to die. Everyone wants to live, even a cockroach. I saw him the other day running around trying to get away. Everyone wants to live, and nobody wants to be diseased. That's why you spend millions of dollars on hospitals every year, because no one wants to be diseased. We all want to be in perfection. And naturally, nobody wants to be miserable, and that's why we're all here in the park, right? Because nobody wants to be miserable. We want to enjoy. So we want to be eternal. We want to be full of knowledge. That's why we go to schools and universities. Nobody wants to be ignorant. And we want to be blissful. That position, sat, eternity, chit, knowledge, ananda, bliss, sat ananda, that is your right. That is you, that is yourself, eternal, full of knowledge and bliss, in your service, in your love for the absolute and all living beings. This is Krishna consciousness. Don't think that Krishna consciousness means another sectarian religion. It doesn't. We're not pushing a religion. I didn't quit all other religions when I was 18 years old and at the age of 19 except this. I'd already rejected organized religions. This is not that. This is not what makes another rope end that doesn't tie to the rest of them. This is what ties all the rope ends together and makes them all seem very sensible why Jesus appeared, why Buddha appeared, why Muhammad appeared, why Sankaracharya, why Chaitanya appeared. There are millions of incarnations and all of them have their function. And this knowledge, although it may appear to have been hidden for thousands of years, is actually revealed if you look at some of the books that we have on display, our spiritual master has very kindly translated the ancient Sanskrit knowledge of India into English. That knowledge which was hidden in Sanskrit, which was being sought after as the fountain of youth, which was being sought after as the wealth of the East. That wealth was not material. Therefore, everyone that went to India to conquer and find the fountain of youth and find the reservoir of wealth, they all became frustrated because they were looking for something material and it wasn't. What they heard about, what they saw through the astrological predictions of the stars, that there was a great wealth in India was true, but it wasn't a material wealth, you see? And therefore it remained hidden from them in this ancient Sanskrit language. So this is the invitation of Krishna consciousness, that you take advantage of this hidden wealth, this fountain of youth that everyone's been looking for for thousands of years, and achieve it. Achieve that reservoir of Satchitananda, eternity, knowledge, and bliss. So some of us are living here in Portland. There's a community on Hawthorne. What is it? 2805 Hawthorne Street. It's a beautiful community. We're visiting it. I'm, my name is Vishnu Jana Swami. I've been in this movement for about seven years now. And we're traveling around the country in a big Greyhound bus. It's parked right over there, in fact. It's fixed up like a temple inside, and we carry all this stuff comes out of its belly, just like a big transcendental fish. It rides into college campuses. It rides into scenes like... In Berkeley and also in Santa Cruz, California, different parts all over the country. And it unfolds a festival just like the one we're having today. It's not an ordinary bus. It feels like that, like a gigantic transcendental fish that kind of swims around in this material world. It's on its way out. And it's inviting other people to get on board too. So any of you that would like to get out of this, this ocean of birth and death, this ocean of old age and disease, and enter into our real atmosphere, eternity, knowledge, and bliss, our invitation is open to all of you to chant, to dance, to feast. Not to necessarily join our religion, not to shave your head, not to put on robes, not to do all the things that we do, but to do that which was done by all great souls, singing the glories of the Absolute, dancing in ecstasy, and feasting on beautiful food first offered with love to the Absolute. That's our invitation, not that you shave your head, you see. Or you have to live in our community, no. But let's come out in the park, let's make this our temple from now on. The churches stay closed all week, so we might as well leave them closed, you know? There's no use 
letting God out for an hour a week, you know, let him have a peek, you know, and close him up again, you know, keep him locked up, and then once a week, pop, out he comes.